Hi, thanks for joining us for the Family Plot, Gardening in the Mid-South. I'm Chris Cooper. Spring is when you enjoy strawberries, but fall is when you renovate your strawberry beds to maximize next year's harvest. Also, you can enjoy your harvest all year long when you can. Today we're canning green beans. That's just ahead on the Family Plot, Gardening in the Mid-South. Production funding for the Family Plot, Gardening in the Mid-South is provided by the WKNO Production Fund, the WKNO Endowment Fund, and by viewers like you. Thank you. Hi, right, Mr. Tom. We're out in the family plot garden. Yes, sir. We're about to renovate strawberries. Yes, we are. All right, so what do we need to do first? Well, first thing that's already been done is mark off the area that we want to till okay. and then kill the grass. All right. Well, uh, sited on five foot by 10 foot uh, piece of property. Now the, so, uh, the ground underneath it, since this had not been tilled, is probably organically deficient. <laughs> so we've got some organic matter here we're going to put on top of it. Okay. And then we're going to put some fertilizer on top of that, uh, preferably like 612-12, low nitrogen, high phosphorus, high potassium, because we don't want a lot of new growth mm -hmm. when the frost comes because the, the young tender leaves can't handle it, but right. the older leaves can. And we're going to just till it all in together at one time. All right, so you ready to get started? I'd be ready. All right. First thing I'm going to do is pull these up and I'll get them out of the way. Okay. The grass killer did its job so we know where to till. Okay, and let's put some humus in there. So you're just kind of dumping it out? Yep. Okay. Now we're going to take a rake and just kind of uh, spread it out evenly. Okay, next, and the last thing we're going to do before we till is put down fertilizer. Recommended is a low nitrogen, high phosphorus, high potassium, because mm -hmm. we don't want a lot of new fresh growth on those strawberries when frost is coming. Now it's time to start the beast. All right. Being in the no-till generation, the two times you really do need to till is when you're putting in a new garden and also if you're putting in lime right. to sweeten the soil. I'm raking up the uh, grass that we dug up and uh, it's not going to go to waste. We're going to set it aside so when a hard frost or freeze comes, we can use that to cover the plants up to protect them. Uh, next thing we're going to do is put down the barrier, okay. which we're using the cheap uh, <laughs> uh, shower curtain liners. The cheap, what, one dollar? <laughs> yeah. Shower curtain. Can't tell you where I got them from, but <laughs> that's one of those closely kept secrets. It even comes with magnets. All right. And we can just lay it down. Okay. The uh, plastic cover, which was in its former life, a uh, shower curtain liner, <laughs> would be used for a couple good reasons. One, as a weed block. Two, retain soil moisture. Mm -hmm. Three, and most important, keep the strawberries clean so the bugs don't eat the bottom and only leaving the top parts for you. <laughs> And I'm using uh, these little anchors that you get for ground cloths. Mm -hmm. They're relatively inexpensive. But if you're cheap like I am, <laughs> you can take those metal coat hangers, straighten mm -hmm. them out, right. and you'll get four of these off of one of those. Okay. So if you want to do the corners. So you put corners. They'll go right through the, both tongs to the plastic. Yeah, they're just yeah, like that. Trying to get it at the end here. All the way down. There you go. And then we'll do the same thing over here. Yeah. And I'm gonna put one right smack in the middle. And uh, now we're gonna put the other one down. Okay. Uh, I'm just putting them on the ends, middle, one in the middle. Uh, since it's six feet uh, long, six feet wide, you might say about three feet apart. Now we're ready to cut some slits and start moving strawberries to their new home. I like a, about eight inches slits. 
And the reason for that is better chance of catching rainwater. And secondly, it's easier to water it. I talked to the uh, professional commercial grower. He recommends 14 to 15 inches apart for a little bit better air circulation. But you gotta keep in mind, he's got a big field. We're limited to five foot by 10 foot area. So I'm gonna stick with the 12 inches apart right now. Okay. Well, uh, as you notice, we got the plastic down anchored and we got slits cut in it. Now it's time to start moving the babies. All right. And I'm gonna start over in this far corner and work my words, uh, way towards the center. And what I'm doing to do is dig it and you'll find that strawberry roots are not very deep. As you can see. Yeah, not at all. Very sh shallow. And we got a daughter on it. So we're gonna go move, dig that up. And there's another daughter. <laughs> now originally planted in here was 10 strawberry plants. And we got, I say, well over 50. Uh, let's see how many plants we got off that one. Well, there is four, one, two, three, four plants, five plants off that one. We got two plants here, I'm just gonna separate them. And there's mm -hmm. three on Story. that one. I'd say make a pretty good investment for only 10 <laughs> plants. Where else are you gonna get free plants like this that are easily separated and replanted? And it's time we'll go ahead and put these in the garden. All right. I want to separate them right at the source. And there is one, That's one plant. mother plant. Again, you can see the roots are shallow. Yeah. So uh, obviously we don't really need to plant it very deep. But we do need to plant it as soon as possible to keep the roots from drying out. And then close up the slit around it. And after we get done doing this, we most surely want to water it. And it'll get climatized to its new home. <laughs> okay, well again, we actually got a couple plants right mm -hmm. here. So I just separated oh, yeah. it. Try to keep as much of the soil. Well, this one here doesn't look prime. So I'm gonna set that one aside. Think about that one. That one looks good. We'll plug this one into the ground. Strawberries like it just like human does. Hmm. If it's comfortable for you, it's comfortable for the plants. <laughs> if it's hot to you, it's hot to them. Right, well, appreciate the demonstration, Mr. Tom. Okay. We'll just finish this on up. Okay. All right. Thank you much. There are a number of gardening events going on in the next couple of weeks. Here are just a few that might interest you. Hi, Miss Kathy, we can eat green beans. Yes. Well, thank you. Uh, we, we're definitely going to appreciate this demonstration that you're about to do for us. <laughs> thank you. All right, so here's my first question, though. Why should we pressure can green beans? Okay, well, it's very important to pressure can your low acid vegetables, things like green beans, um, squash, anything low acid has to be pressure canned to kill the bacteria, bacteria and the possibility of botulism being formed. Wow. Mm -hmm. So how do we get started? Well, the first thing you do is assemble all of your ingredients. Okay. And this is something that you may want to just mark a day off on your calendar mm -hmm. because you want to have your green beans ready to go. And what I like to do is go to the farmer's market mm -hmm. and buy, uh, we normally say about one 
one pound of green beans per pint jar. Okay. So if you were going to do a dozen pints, you'd get about 12 pounds of green beans. Okay. So you get your green beans ready, your pressure canner, and we like to have people come by the office, bring their lid, if they have a dial gauge, and let us test their dial gauge. Okay. And we test it at 5, 10, and 15 pounds of pressure. Uh, many times, maybe it's been in an attic, and the gasket has dry rotted. So we also tell people before they get started, they want to get a little bit of cooking oil, non-salted cooking oil, and oil that gasket. And they can learn from my experience. We forgot to do this one year. Remember, we had I to call y'all in <laughs> to get the lid I off. Do. So you want to go ahead and oil your lid before you get started. And then you want to have your um, Lids simmering. We've got those simmering at 180 degrees. We have our jars. Ideally, we would have a huge stock mm -hmm. pot with simmering water, mm -hmm. but we don't have that. So we've cheated a little bit. <laughs> and so we've good. got four jars hot in a crock pot, uh, some water simmering because we're doing the cold pack. And then you want to have your canning salt, your basic canning equipment, the timer and the rings and also some pot holders sure. and your instructions. Even if you've done this a dozen times, you still want to have your recipe and read through it so you don't forget anything. All right, well, we're going to mm -hmm. let you go ahead and get started. Then. Okay, right. what we've done, like we said, we went ahead and we've got everything, the water that we need is simmering. So the first thing we're going to do is get one of our hot jars. And people say, well, why do you have to heat these jars up? If you don't have a hot jar and you put it in a hot pressure canner, what's going to happen? The jar will crack. Yeah. Well, we may still have something crack, but we're going to go ahead and put these green beans in the jar. Okay, so you fill it up just about to the top? Just about okay. to the top, and then I'm going to get some hot water. Very hot water. Because mm -hmm. see, we've got our hot jar. Mm -hmm. And we're going to go ahead and spoon that hot water into the jar. I may have to take some of these green beans out. We're just going to go ahead and experiment with this. And you want to fill it to within one inch of the top. That's okay. important because you want to have one inch of head space. Okay. So what we can do, ah, you have to push pack these it. down. You have to pack it down. Ah. And like we said, one inch, that's probably more than one inch, so we can just pour this out. Okay, pour a little of that out. Mm -hmm. And you may have to experiment. Okay, and we just happen to have a ruler here, and these are in increments of a fourth, one half, all the way up to one okay. inch. Okay. So you see we're looking at about one inch. And then we want to run this down the sides of the jar to get out the air bubbles. Oh, see okay. all of those I air see bubbles? Yes, you do. Lots of air bubbles. These green beans are so pretty. <laughs> uh, I tell you, they're nice and fresh. Uh -huh. Then you want to add one half teaspoon of canning salt, about a half a teaspoon per pint. So why are we using the salt? Well, the salt helps in the preservation. And people have asked me, what's the difference between canning salt and regular salt. Okay, here's the canning salt. You can buy it at any uh, grocery store. Mm -hmm. or But the this says pickling and canning salt. It's non-iodized, and it's a much finer salt than regular salt. You can see how fine that okay, is. Okay. But that helps in the preservation. Okay. So the next thing you want to do, you want to wipe the top of the jar. You want to wipe that real good. I may be able to add a few more green beans in there. And I just happen to have some extra green beans. So we're going to put a few more green beans in there because you want to pack them down. Since you're doing pressure canning, what will ultimately happen when we take these out of the pressure canner? The green beans will rise to the top. Oh. And you might have two inches of water at the bottom, which is OK but still you want it to, mm -hmm. to look good. So you have to put a lid on this that has been simmering 
at 180 degrees. So over here we have our pot and I've got this simmering at 180 degrees. Ah, so it's right on it. Yeah, and you can let these simmer for, for as long as you're doing your pressure canning, but you go ahead and you lift this out and you put it on the rim, okay. just like that. And then you so take you have have your, a good seal. you've got, see that little rubber on the rim mm -hmm. is going to adhere to it. And then you screw this band on just fingertip tight. Okay, just fingertip mm -hmm. tight, not too tight. And then we're going to take this and place it into the canner. Uh -huh. And if you can see the canner, we've got about two to three inches of water in our pressure canner. We also have a rack in the bottom of the canner. Let's say you've lost your rack somewhere. You can put a towel in the bottom of this, but uh, you've got to have something on the bottom of the rack. So we're going to go ahead and fill the other three okay. jars, and then we'll come back and start up again. All right. Okay. All right, so that was the last one. I was the last one. We've got all four. And we put these down in the canner. And now we're going to secure the lid. That's okay. the hard part. Oh, so this is the yeah, hard part. Yeah, because you've got two V's that you want to line up. Okay, see that V? Oh, okay. We're going to line it. that up right here. Just line it up. And it takes a little muscle. And you just you close this. Mm -hmm. Now, this is where your patience comes in. We're going to go ahead and turn up the flame. And what we'll do is allow this to vent for 10 minutes. Okay. It's going to take several minutes for steam to start coming out of this. But after we allow it to vent for 10 minutes, we're going to put the petcock on. And then that is when our steam, uh, our pressure will start building. Uh -huh. And we will count after it gets up to 11 pounds of pressure. We'll begin counting 20 minutes. Okay. And we'll let this pressure for 20 minutes, 11 pounds, and then we'll let it cool down. We're mm -hmm. not going to put cold water on it. Some people <laughs> do that. We will just let it cool down naturally. And after it gets to zero, we'll wait an additional 10 minutes. Okay. All right, Ms. Kathy, we've been at zero here for about 10 or 15 minutes. So yes. are we ready? We're ready. All right. Even though I know it has cooled down, I'm still going to use okay, a sure. pot holder. Sure. And I'm going to take the pet cock off. And then we're going to open the lid and you need to remember to tilt it away from you right. because there will be steam. Uh -huh. Oh yeah, So we're steam. tilting that away and we're going to remove our jars. Uh -huh. Oh, the water is still simmering. Okay. And you want to place them on a um, cutting board or a towel away from a draft. Uh -huh. And we're going to leave these undisturbed anywhere from 12 to 24 hours. Okay. And as the lids seal, we should hear a popping sound. It might happen soon or it may take several minutes okay. for them to pop. And like we said, these can be kept for up to two years. And let me show you some that I've done uh, in years past. These were done in June of 2011. Oh, and I found them tilted over and you see the white residue yes, on the bottom. That. These that are not, no, no, yeah. this is not good. You, they're discolored and you hear how that sounds. Okay. And the lid is puffy, so those are unsafe to eat. These I did in 2012. They remained upright in a cool, dark place and the lid is still sealed. Mm -hmm. No discoloration, no discolor. right. still bright green. These are safe. Okay. And these I did this past Saturday. I did some salsa. And um, these are good, are too, good as well. for okay. up to two years. Okay. okay. So is there a publication about canning foods? Yes, we have a publication. It's publication number 724. Okay. And you can just go online, publication number 724, okay. and you can download it free of charge. Okay. Well, wow, there goes another pop. Oh, great. All okay, right. we're done. Good. We success. Well, Ms. Kathy, appreciate it again. <laughs> Thank you, So Chris. professional. We do appreciate that. Thank, Thank you much. You. All right. Thank you. It looks like a rodent has been in our flower bed, and from the damage here, I think it was an armadillo. Armadillos like to root up your lawn. They also like to root up your flower beds, hence displacing your flowers. They're actually in here looking for grubs and earthworms, because that is their diet. 
And as you can tell, it has scurried along uh, the way here throughout the flower beds. If you happen to see the armadillo, make sure you don't handle it because it does carry the bacterium, which leads to human leprosy. Even though they don't run that fast, you can run up behind them, but I would not suggest doing that. So again, the best way to do that is set up a wing trap, lure them in with bait, and that way you can get them. All right, Mr. Tom, here's our Q&A session. You ready? I'd be ready. All right, these are some good questions. Here's our first viewer email. When I plant in the spring, I cover the soil with fabric. Mm -hmm. Should I remove the fabric during the winter and till the soil? And this is from uh, Gary. So what do you think about that? Should I remove the fabric during the winter and till the soil? Well, I highly re recommend removing it. I highly recommend removing it. I highly recommend removing it. Uh, tilling the soil, well, we're like in a no-till area. Uh, society now right but uh, the fact is i do like to break up the soil because at times when you pull this stuff up there's been on there a couple years it seems like and i don't know what happens to them but all the organic matter is gone mm. and you're left with just like clay mm -hmm. especially like if you uh, do landscaping you put down that uh, cloth to prevent weeds from coming right. up and you put rocks cloth. on it right when you end up pulling up the rocks you'll find that it's almost no organic matter in there. Right. Again, I have no idea. Maybe the worms ate it off. <laughs> but uh, no, I highly recommend removing it. And if you don't, uh, after about three or four years, it just deteriorates. Yeah, it breaks apart. It anyway. Breaks apart. It looks right. like looks like it turns into like soot. Right. So you might as well start with some fresh fabric in, in the in the spring. Okay. Plus the fact it gives us a chance for the soil to air out, uh, and it does block some of the air. So okay, I recommend it. So there you have it, Mr. Gary. I hope that helps you out. All right, here's our next viewer email. Is it too late to plant greens? And this is from Miss Sue. So what do you think? Is it, is it too late at this point now into October? Yes. To plant? Yes. Yes. Okay. Uh, yes. Typically, uh, you usually plant your greens uh, July, August. Oh, okay. Uh, and start harvesting in about mid-October, if not sooner. Okay. But if you start them now, they're going to be tiny little plants. And they aren't going to get hardened up yeah. from uh, the cold. Yeah. Uh, and even then, when we get our hard freeze, then the plants are gone. You know, right. so. And that time is usually, I think the average date for that is November the 6th. I'm going to say uh, my wife and I's anniversary is November the 12th. <laughs> and typically, it'd be a frosty morning. It'd be a frosty morning. Okay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so it's too late. So even I would collars, say, mustards, uh, collars, turnips. Collars, mustard, turnip greens. Uh, What's the other? There's four popular ones. Uh, kale. Kale. Okay. Kale. Yeah. Kale. Right. Yeah. Uh, like I said, out there at the Shelby Farms, uh, family plots, garden plots. Uh, typically, they they place they plant in August, okay. in uh, July and August. Funny thing about it, <clears throat> on the turnip greens, you can go out there right now, and there will be turnips laying around everywhere, because yeah. the people don't want the turnips; they just want the greens. They want the greens. So right. they pull them That's up right. and toss away the turnips. Yeah. So I bought some, my wife and I didn't like it, so we left them on the ground. Okay. <laughs> All right, but it's too late now for Miss Sue. It's too late. Yep. So the answer to the question. I feel so. Yes. All right, here's our next viewer email. This weed is growing in my lawn. What is it? And this is from Miss Linda. There's a couple of things in that picture, Miss Linda. First of all, there's ground ivy. And the second thing, you know, there's actually some wild violet in there as well, but it's more of the ground ivy. And mm -hmm. the thing about ground ivy is this. It's a perennial. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, it has a square stem. Square stem means it's in the mint family. Oh, okay. So if you actually crush it up or run your lawnmower across it, you can smell it. Hmm. All right? Uh, it actually grows by stolons, but it likes damp, shady conditions. Kind of like we shady. get in the wintertime. Kind of like we get in the wintertime. Right. Hmm. I mean, it, and it can actually tolerate full sun after it's grown in those, con, you know, the damp conditions. Hmm. Then it'll kind of reach out a little bit. So, hmm. you know, this is in your lawn. Before we even start about using, you know, herbicides mm -hmm. and things like that, I usually tell folks, culturally, you know what you should do? Grow a thick stand of grass, because it would actually crowd it out. Oh, you culturally, yeah, yeah. Get your fertility right, pH and things like that. Grow a thick stand of grass. You don't have to worry about that. Yeah. Or you might have to limb up, you know, a couple of trees or whatever to let more sun uh, down in that spot. Then maybe you won't have the mm -hmm. ground ivy. Yeah, and uh, zoysia grass. Thick like carpet. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, matter of fact, I tell people that Bermuda is very polite grass. Come on in. 
right. mellow. Yeah. Uh, uh, Zoysia is a, one right. of the neighborhood it's grass bully. Thick. Don't, because e don't even try it. At the end of the day, weeds are looking for space. Mm -hmm. So they can find space in your Bermuda, but as thick as Zoysia is, it's hard for it to get in there. Mm -hmm. So there you have it, Miss Linda. That is ground ivy with a little bit of wild violets in there. We all know wild violets are pretty tough to mm -hmm. control as well. All right? So, Mr. Tom, that was fun. That sounds good. All right. Thank you much for being here. Thank you. Okay. Remember, we love to hear from you. Send us an email or letter. The email address is familyplot at wkno.org, and the mailing address is familyplot7151 Cherry Farms Road, Cordova, Tennessee, 38016. Or you can go online to familyplotgarden.com. That's all we have time for today. You can get more information on renovating your strawberry bed or canning green beans at familyplotgarden.com. We also have demonstrations on canning peaches and tomatoes. I'm Chris Cooper. Be sure to join us next week for the Family Plot, Gardening in the Mid-South. Be safe.